Hey, welcome to the Hell Has an Exit podcast. I'm your host, Brian Alzate. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 833-999-1877 to speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com. Hey, welcome to Hell Has an Exit. I'm your host, Brian Alzate. On this show, we interview recovering addicts to discuss their daily lives and how they overcame addiction. Today, I have Brad R. on the show. What's up, Brad? So I don't know too much about you. I have seen you pretty much since you've been clean, basically, I would say. Where are you from? So originally, I'm from uh, Baltimore, Maryland. Did, were you clean before you got here, or did you get here to get clean? I moved here originally in 2015. Mm-hmm. I went to a treatment center in Michigan. They set me up with a, um, a halfway out here. And then I went back to Michigan to work at the treatment center. That's where I, you know, I got my degree there. Okay, so you you had clean time prior. Correct, yeah. I had three and a half years at one point. Gotcha, because, you know, in recovery, you could kind of tell. And, like, when you would speak or talk or whatever, like, you could tell that you've been in recovery before. Yeah. Or So this wasn't new to you. No, no, no. So, I mean, like, I had three and a half years at one point. Um, I moved back to Michigan. Mm-hmm. I worked at a treatment center. You know, they paid for me to go to school. I got a degree. I was a therapist for a while. Really? Yeah, I know. You're I a therapist? I know I don't look like it. But. So wait, so you got clean in 2015. You were clean for three years and you became a therapist? Yeah. Like you were a counselor at a treatment center? Yeah. When I first started, I was a tech, uh-huh. you know, and, and then I went to school. I got my CAC. I specialized more in trauma therapy. Okay. That, that was kind of my thing was trauma therapy. And then... Uh, so how old were you and a therapist? 21. You were 21 and you were a therapist? 21. Uh, and you had, so you had a CAC. Wow. When I first got clean, I was like, dude, what am, what do I even want to do in my uh-huh. life? You know, because I, I really Everyone didn't. wants to work in treatment. Yeah. I, I mean, no, I didn't. You know? <laughs> you didn't? Okay. No, I, so so I didn't. I was I was young, and mm-hmm. I didn't think I was even going to make it to that old in the beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, I was, I was very convinced that before 18, I was going to be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. You know, and, and, and when I got clean, I didn't know what I wanted to do in my life. They offered me the job, and I was like, listen, I can't go home. I hate Florida. It's hot. I don't really like it. You're from Florida? No, I'm from Baltimore. But when I moved here after treatment, okay, um, I was here for like six six months. Okay, six or seven months, and then I moved back to Michigan. Okay, you know they offered me the job, and I was like, dude, I hate Florida. Mm-hmm. I was like, yo, I'm just gonna go to Michigan, see what happens. You know they 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 sent me through school, and it was kind of just a thing where it was like I didn't really know what else to do with my mm-hmm. life. I loved helping people, you know. So I was like, yo, I might as well just try this out. It got dark fast, man. Why? Just because, like, were you not going to meetings and stuff? So I was. Or did at, you slow I, down? I was at first. Okay. When I first got there, you know, I was hitting meetings every day. Mm-hmm. I had a sponsor. I was working steps. I was going to conventions. Did you fall into like you thought treatment was part of your recovery? No. So I fo- I, I fell into I was in a relationship with a normie. Okay. She so had, the relationship trap. She had kids. You know, I was like, listen, you know, I work in treatment. I don't really need to be um, going to meetings that much. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, she didn't really understand the whole, I I need to go to meetings every single day. Mm -hmm. It wasn't concerning to her. She was just like, oh, cool. That's great. She didn't really understand. She's never dated an addict. Mm -hmm. You know, for her, it was like, she she just didn't get it. You know, that one day, don't you think you could have a drink just once? Mm. Sounded good. You know, two weeks later, I'm smoking crack in her bathroom and I'm the bad guy. Yeah, that's since I've been clean, like... Maybe not like as much now, but like when I first got clean, like when I would meet people like girls and I start dating them, I would uh, make it really clear. Like if I drink alcohol, I will steal everything <laughs> from you and like rob your house and like take your car, a cruel debt in your name and like steal your identity or sell your identity. Like I was like pretty adamant with telling because I didn't want I didn't want to be in that position where someone didn't respect my recovery. Because especially when you're young, other young people are like, well, I don't really see you as that type of person. And like, you know, why can't you drink? So like, I was always pretty adamant. I was like laying like some boundaries saying like, look, I need to do these things. And if I don't do these things, like I'm in trouble. So I did. When I first got clean, I was 20 years old, Mm -hmm. you know? So she was like, you never had a legal drink before? And I was like, no. Mm -hmm. And she's like, well, why not? And I was like, because like, I'm going to smoke crack in your bathroom and uh, it's going to be really bad. 
she like laughed. Mm -hmm. You know, she, she just didn't understand. None of her family was in recovery. Mm -hmm. No one really understood. She worked at the center. That's how I met her. But she worked like in the store. They gotcha. had like this store to sold cigarettes uh -huh. and stuff. You know, she just didn't understand it. When, when, when I walked away from the fellowship, you know, those questions eventually start to sound a little bit better. Mm -hmm. You know, that one drink, I was like, you know what? Like maybe I just went through a phase. You know, I started using really, really young. And I was like, maybe I just was in, maybe it was the environment. It wasn't really mm -hmm. me. You know, I was like, I've, I've worked my steps. You know, I've had sponsees. Like I'm, I could be fine. I'm just, I'm just going to drink one time and everything is going to be straight. Mm -hmm. You know, I went out for her brother's bachelor party. Don't know how I got home. When I woke up, there was throw up everywhere and she was pissed. Mm -hmm. And then I just started drinking throughout the day, like at night after work. And then one day I go to the gas station and the guy's like, hey, you know, you want anything? And I'm like, yeah, I can hide it this time. And and it, and it was just bad from there. Gotcha. So how did you, what's your story on like how you started using, like what growing up was like? You know, growing up, I, I thought I had a normal childhood, but I really didn't. You know, and and through step. I don't work. think anyone does. No, no, no. But I, I always said I was like, dude, I was raised like proper. Mm -hmm. You know, the reality of it is, is like my mom is like the epitome of a saint. If one day that I can marry a woman and have kids with a woman, that's like half of the woman my mom is. Like I've I've, I've mm -hmm. done well. You know, uh, my dad just wasn't there. You know, my my dad was a um a homicide detective and worked drug unit for the Baltimore City Police Department. Wow. You know, my uncle, who's my mom's twin brother, in and out of prison. And this is life. in Maryland. In in Baltimore. So the only thing I know about Baltimore is the wire. Yeah, it's it's very accurate. Listen, it's it's a place where it's like, you know, the reality of it is is like yo, you you get out mm -hmm. or you don't. Period. You know, like yo, you get out and like you make something of yourself, or the reality of it is it's like all of my friends are like dead prison or on their way there. Mm -hmm. You know? And growing up was weird, man. Like you know, my, my brother got sick with cancer really young. How many siblings? I have uh, one older brother and one younger brother. You know, my, my older brother got sick with cancer very, very young. You know, it kind of had me at this point where, like, I had to grow up fast. You know, my dad was never around. My mom did her best to raise two kids. You know, when my brother was sick, he'd be in the hospital for weeks and weeks and weeks at a time. It was kind of just like, yo, fend for yourself. You know, I was always like this kid that was like, I, I was, I was so good at everything I did if I really wanted to, right? Like didn't try in school, still did well. Didn't really try in sports, did really well. But I was a kid that was like lacking like a sense of like, like a male figure in his life. You know, I'm, I'm not going to like out the person that did it or the people that have done it, but I'm a, I'm a product of molestation. It happened very, very young. And then it happened multiple times by multiple different people as I was growing up. Did you ever speak up or say anything about it as a kid? No. The first time I talked about it, I was at a meeting in Delray, Crossroads. Mm -hmm. and um, So you went to treatment and didn't even bring it up in treatment? Never. Wow. Yo, I never... Because normally that's like when, it, when people bring it up. I didn't want to believe it. Yeah, so you had like this idea of like, if you talk about it, it's real. Yeah, and it was like this thing of like, yo, don't you know who I am? Like mm -hmm. this lifestyle that I lived um, didn't allow me to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. You know, the lifestyle that I lived was all my friends, you know, gang life, drug dealing, you know, a lot of criminal stuff. And, and that's just the way it was. You know, we were we were young, dumb, and like it, it just was what it was. There was no way for me to say that because I remember when people used to talk about like, you know, especially when we were growing up, it was a little bit different than it is now. But, you know, do you see that guy? He's like dating this guy. Like, mm -hmm. you know, they make fun of him. Yeah, so I was like, you know, if I tell someone that I was molested yeah, by a male. Yeah, and it's like. Growing up, like now, people don't like say faggot and gay as much, you know. It's but not like, really a thing. But like, gro growing up, like you had Eminem saying it, you had like a lot of rappers saying it. Like saying gay was like, you know, like there's like that Kanye clip. Like saying gay was like saying not cool. Like if right. something was gay, like wasn't cool. It wasn't necessarily like that somebody was gay. Like we didn't grow. I didn't grow up with like homophobic. It was also like a really bad insult at the time. Yeah. You know, as like, as, as men, you don't want to be called that if you're not, you know what I mean? Yeah. And it's, and it's like, yo, I was like hiding this my whole entire life. So I, I did whatever it possibly took to, for people to not, mm -hmm. not suspect it, you know, cause you know, like, yo, yo, when you stay at like your boy's house and like you're chilling with your boy every single day, mm -hmm. you know, it's your role doll, it's your man's and, and, and you guys like stay at each other's house all night. They're like, yo, what are you, a faggot? Mm-hmm. 
you know? And so like in my head, I'm like, yo, if I tell these people that like I was molested by a guy, am I a faggot? Yeah. You know, and, it, and or, or they'll make fun of you or something. Yeah, yeah especially like, kids. Yo, it like made it made me feel some type of way. Like it, it started like it started this thing because when I was young, I was like a really hyper kid. Mm -hmm. You know, I had like ADHD. Like like it was to the point where like if I didn't take my medicine, like yo, people did not want me at their house because mm -hmm. I was a fucking nut. I, I went to I went to school and they were like, yo, if you don't get your kid on medication, like, like he, super ADHD, he can't come back. Mm -hmm. You know, I remember like you know if I would be like hyper or whatever. My boy would be like, yo, you're a fucking weirdo. Take your medication. Mm -hmm. You know, so like as a kid, I'm like, yo, if I tell someone about this, this is what they can use this against me. Mm -hmm. And like, I just was like petrified of that. Yeah, I think a lot of people are with so many things. And I think that like treatment is usually like the place where, where people talk about it because it's like, you know, in treatment, you see so many other people talking about it that like, you know, it kind of will encourage people to speak up about it. But even like like going to meetings was the first time I talked. I, I heard grown men talking about being molested. And I think now, I think fifty percent of men that are addicts or in the rooms probably have been have been molested. So I, I remember when I first got into treatment, like I suppressed it for so long. I just I didn't feel like it was real. And then I also like felt some type of way. And now I didn't know how to say it because of who the person was. Mm -hmm. It was someone that was really close so you know I, I couldn't say it because like i just didn't i didn't want my family to know i remember I, i'll never forget like i was in the meeting and and i also thought that i was the only one mm -hmm. like i thought i was different and then like in treatment i never spoke about it because i had this thing you know how like you have the people in in the rooms where they're like yo i fucking sold so much crack i'm like tony montana yeah like the one-uppers yeah like the ones that like want to make their story something i was that one that didn't want you to know a lot of things so you didn't think i was that bad mm-hmm like, I didn't want people to know my life. I didn't want people to know my story. I didn't want people to know the shit that I've done because I wanted everyone to think that I wasn't as bad as I, as I got. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was like that minimizer. Yeah, so you have two opposite spectrums. You have someone in treatment who's minimizing everything, and then you have someone who, like, exaggerates everything, you know? Yeah, it's like every person but that goes... Both, but both of them are doing the same thing, is that they're trying to make their story not sound like they belong. They're like, I'm so bad, I can't be helped, or I'm not that bad, I don't need the help. Yeah, and it's like, dude, like, I, I would go to treatment, and I, and I remember, like, you know, the, the kids would be like, yo, like, I was the biggest drug dealer in my mm -hmm. town, and I'm like, yo, if you were really that big of a drug dealer, you wouldn't be, you here. Wouldn't be here, you'd still yeah. be doing drugs, uh -huh. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, your mom wouldn't be packing your underwear. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty sure you had to call your mom and mm -hmm. put money on your books so you can buy cigarettes. Exactly. You know, but like my thing was like, yo, I, I wanted to do everything that I possibly could to make myself not feel like I belong here so I can go back home. What was your story when you started using? I always hear like on the podcast, like when you ask that question, you know what I always think about is like, um, you know, when people in the meetings say that like my, my worst day in recovery is better than my best day using mm -hmm. Like, I think that's such bullshit, dude. It is bullshit. I have fun. Yeah. But I think it's like, like the way that I interpret it is like, if I was like, yo, here's a cupcake, but then I'm going to kick you in the nuts after. Because it's like, dude, it doesn't matter if it's downhill. Even though your best day using, it's still going to suck eventually. So it's like. Eventually. Yeah. But like, yo, in the beginning. Yeah, it's fun. Yo, I had so much fun. Yeah. That's why we're here. You know, mm -hmm. like. Yo, I, I know that the first time I ever used, I was like, yo, I never want to feel this way any other way ever again. Like, cause my first- Yeah, you know you're an addict when you get high and you want to stay that way forever. Yeah, and like, yo, my first my mm -hmm. first time getting high, I smoked, uh, I smoked weed laced with PCP. That's your first time? That was my first time. And I was like, yo, I fucking love this. Mm -hmm. All my friends are freaking out. Right. What do people call that? Shrimp? Sh uh, shrimp sticks. Shrimp so, sticks. So so we okay. call them we call it we call it wet. Right. right. We call okay. it floater boats or whatever. But you know, so I, I remember we're like sitting at this girl Stephanie's house, right? I'm in i I'm in like sixth grade. I think I was actually I was thinking I was in fifth grade, actually. Mm -hmm. I, th I was like nine. This kid comes over, right? And he's like old as fuck. You know, he's probably like my age and he's mm -hmm. hanging out with like kids. Yeah. And I'm like, this guy's mad fucking weird. Mm -hmm. You know, but he uh he he pulled out this thing and he's like, Yo, you ever smoked weed? And I was like, no. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, you ever smoked PCP? And I was like, no, what's that? And he was like, it's what they stick in dead people. And I was like, sign me up. Let's fucking do it. You <laughs> Sounds know? cool. Because like, yo, I was a fucking shit mm -hmm. show of a kid. You know what's interesting is that people 
will claim that they've never been molested, but like they all have stories like that. In my opinion, like anybody that has been exposed to adult things before they were an adult by an adult, to me, is a form of like being molested. If you're a kid and an adult is like, hey, you want to do some coke? You want to fucking smoke or, or something? He might not have like touched you inappropriately sexually, but people have this idea that like molestation is only sexual. No. And like the reality is like any form of bringing a child into the adult world or showing them the adult world is exposing them to something that they're not ready for, like mentally, you know, probably because that person, someone did that to them. Yeah. So it's like this impending cycle. So like I made and and the reason why I did it, the reason why I was like, yeah, fuck it, let's do it. Because I never wanted to feel like I was doing something without my consent ever again. Mm hmm. And that's what it was. So like when people would try to like peer pressure me, I would just be like, yo, fuck it, let's do it. Because I wanted to make the decision on my own. The control. It was it was like the molestation all over again. Mm -hmm. I was like, yo, you're, no one is ever going to force me to do anything ever again. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fuck my life up by myself. Mm -hmm. the, the reason why I did what I did was was really because like I wanted, to, I wanted someone to like realize that something was fucking wrong. Mm -hmm. And like no one did. You know, so I kept making these decisions and fucking my life up and I would constantly be going to jail or constantly getting arrested. You know what I mean? Like constantly using or, mm -hmm. or getting expelled from school because I wanted my family to realize that like, yo, there's something fucking wrong with this kid. Like what happened? Yeah, it's strange because it's like you can want help, but like you don't you have no idea how to say it or ask or even talk about it. And then you feel like, dude, even if you help me, like, like, or if you knew what is the help for? And then, you know, as someone in recovery, like when I see a kid acting out, like I know that there's something going on with them. And, and I think society just labels them as like crazy or, or they have a problems. lost cause yeah. or, you know, this kid needs to, or like a disciplinary thing. You know, I remember growing up and like people just thinking like he just needs more discipline. Oftentimes the discipline is great, but like if like he doesn't talk to a therapist, like the kid's never gonna figure it out. But you know what's fucked up is um eventually my family realized that something was wrong. My mm -hmm. mom did. You know, I'm I'm super open about like shit that's happened in my life when it's not gonna hurt someone else. So mm -hmm. like I, I'm very I'm very weird about who I share the first molestation with, like who it was, because you know, especially if it's podcast gonna be on the internet, things yeah, like that. You don't never want to do that. But you know, that person has to like deal with their demons by themselves. But the second time it happened, my family knew something was wrong. My mom you know, was like, yo, you got to go to therapy. Like, you're fucked up, mm -hmm. you know? You know, I started talking to this therapist, and it's like this weird fucking guy. And I'm like, yeah, this is just, this guy's weird, you know? I get super honest about, like, things that have happened. Like, yo, and then he molested me. The therapist? <laughs> yo, so, like. Wow. And it wasn't, like, a phys like, it wasn't, like, full physical, like, Mm -hmm. sexual molestation right it was like it, it was like yo he would like ask me certain questions about like molestation and then he would touch me and then like at that point oh my god yeah so how's the kid ever gonna trust yo how am i ever gonna trust another man again yeah and that's why recovery was so hard for me mm -hmm. you know because like yo as my story gets farther in mm -hmm. you start to see like more reasons why i shouldn't trust another guy i always say like the worst thing you could be it's not a bad guy. It's like a bad guy that pretends to be a good guy. Yeah. So it's like, dude, if you're going to be a bad guy, like just be a bad guy, but don't pretend to be a good guy because that's when you like are like a real piece of shit. You, you know, know, it's even worse when you're, when you're a good guy and you pretend to be bad. <laughs> that, that, that's what kids do, you know? You know, cause like, yo, I lost myself. Mm -hmm. Never knew who the fuck I was. You know, I'll, I'll never forget that question when I was in treatment and, and the, the group facilitator was like, yo, what do you like to do for fun? You know, I went to the park to play basketball. Really, it was mm -hmm. because like, you know, I wanted to sell drugs with the older kids. Mm -hmm. Like I, I just, you know, I grew up so fucking young and like, and then my brother got sick and my mom was always with him and my dad was never around going from like my grandparents and staying there to like my friend Tommy's house. And then my friend Jake's house, you know, like staying at other people's houses. Cause like my dad was a fucking piece of shit. You know what I mean? Like your son is going through cancer. Your other son like is, is ruining his life as, as a child. Mm -hmm. And like, yo, you're just worried about like your next fucking girlfriend or, or, or your job. And it just made me lose myself, man. You know, and and I knew that I was a good person. Like I always, I always, I always know that I'm a good person. Mm -hmm. Like I always say that I'm not a piece of shit. I just did piece of shit things. And when did the using start to become like real addiction? Yo, for for me, yo, from the start. Like yo, the first time I picked up, 
I remember like I smoked that dip. I'm like 10 years old buying like PCP from this fucking grown ass <laughs> man. This kid's like, you know, show me different ways to smoke mm-hmm. it. You know, I, I hit it. I hit it well for a long time, man. Like, you know, I still, I still played sports. I still went to school when I wasn't kicked out or when I wasn't suspended, but like my friends never really knew, you know, like I, I would, I would like smoke weed with them. Mm-hmm. And then like, I'd always tell them like, yo, I got to go home. And then like, I would go get high my way. I would say around like 14, 14 or 15. That's when I got hooked into like pain medication. I, I'll never forget that, man. It was like the first night I, I, I was the first day I was like, I was hanging out with this older kid again, you know, and we used to do like blunt rides mm-hmm. through this call this town called Bayside beach. It was like this nice ass neighborhood. He was like, yo, try this pill. And I was like, do I just eat it? And he was like, no, sniff it. And I was like, all right. So I sniffed it and then I like projectile vomited yeah. out of the back of his truck. But then how good do you feel after that? Yo, <laughs> I was like, dude, this is great, mm-hmm. you know? And I kept that up for a while because I always sold drugs. So I always had money to do it, you know? What were these, like Roxy's? Yeah. Blues. Uh-huh. Blues. Yeah. Yeah, it's crazy how like violently sick you get. Like the I got sick from opiates like the first six times. And I just kept doing them. Miserable. It's like an exorcist type of vomiting. Yo. It's like, it's not like, oh, you feel nauseous for a little bit. Like once you do it, like throwing up immediately, it's you know? It's like projectile yeah, vomiting. Proje- yeah, it comes out at 100 miles an hour. Yeah, it's yeah. It like, yo, after you throw up, your throat's all fucked mm-hmm. up. Yeah, the worst is when you do it and you haven't eaten. And then the bile in your stomach, fucking like, uh, yeah, you're just driving even bile. <laughs> it's like not coming up. When you've had a good throw up after opiates, like you do feel god kissing you on the cheek giving you a big warm hug it just feels so yo, good i compare it to like yo remember the first time you had sex it was horrible was it yeah the first time i had sex wasn't uh great so i had a babysitter i, th- was- I didn't have i didn't like orgasm when i had first time i had sex no no it was like in the back of a car <laughs> It was horrible, but like her brother like pulled up next to us and she was like, oh my gosh, they jumped off me. <laughs> so I was at my friend's house and, and his parents went out to the bar. He had a babysitter and, you know, she was so hot. You know, we're, we were playing like Twister and I was like young, bro. I, was, I think I was like 11 or 12. Yeah, you're like really playing Twister. <laughs> really playing Twister. And she got us to smoke weed. Mm-hmm. And like we, me and my friend like acted like it was our first time smoking weed. And then we hit like the liquor cabinet. Mm-hmm. And like, I'm like 11. And now that I think about it, like when I got older, I'm like, yo, she, she like molested me too. But, I, but I'm like, <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like so okay with it. Yeah. You know, how this, old was she? She was like 17. Wow. So you lost your virginity she was at a 11 woman. and she was 17. Like she wasn't wearing sports bras, like kid, mm-hmm. girls my age. Like she was like a grown woman. Mm-hmm. I mean, like, yo, it was probably the best two seconds of her life. Mm-hmm. Probably the worst two seconds of her life, but it was the best two seconds of my life. Definitely didn't last long enough for her to have fun. After I had sex with her, like as a fucking kid, I like walk into my boy's room and mm-hmm. I'm like, yo, I'm the man. Yeah. He's like, what are you talking about? I was like, yo, I just fucked her, dude. Mm-hmm. He's like, dude, you're lying. I was like, smell my finger. <laughs> Only reason I said smell my fingers because like I seen that on a movie one time. Uh, yeah, I mean, opiates is... Uh Man, like I always share, it's like, dude, you could do opiates and someone could be like, yo, we, we, we got to pen- paint the fence outside for eight hours in the hot sun. And you're like, okay, like Fuck with a it. smile on your face. Let's fucking run. Out. Yeah. I remember I used to do opiates in the morning and my friend used to pick me up at 630 in the morning for work. And I used to like put like four Roxy's on my counter and I would be like, good night guys. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> And I would fucking wake up at two in the morning and like look at the clock and look at them. Like, uh, you know, I go back to sleep and I wake up at three and I look at them and I wake up at four. And I'm like, oh, it's early enough. And then I would do all four. And then I would be so gassed up in my room. I'd be skipping to the front of the neighborhood because I just can't get picked up at my house and just have so much energy. And my friend would pick me up like half awake and I would be in there with a hot pocket in my hand, like ready to go. Fuck yeah. Life's so good. <laughs> like just so happy. And then two hours later, I'm just like nodded out. Yo, opiates really did fuck my life up. But it only feels. I think. It, I think opiates only feel good for like six months of doing them. After a while, it was literally just chasing not being dope sick. For me, you know what I would do, like when I was when I was like younger, I would like, and I would get really annoying on opiates. I would get really annoying and like scratch my face until it bled and like talk too much yes I, I don't know like yo, what i would do i would get high for like three four months and then stop for like two weeks three weeks and then get high again <laughs> and then stop mm-hmm. and then like i i do remember the first time i got like dope sick mm-hmm. at that time i was just like yo i don't fucking feel good 
So, like, I thought I was just, like, getting sick all the time. Mm-hmm. I just didn't really associate. Because I, I didn't really know anyone that was, like... Withdrawn, yeah. Right. Like, no one really knew what the fuck that was. Mm-hmm. Hey, guys. It's a new year, and you've got goals. And Factor is here to help you achieve each and every one of them. Save time and have the energy you need to tackle everything on your to-do list with Factor's ready-to-eat meals delivered straight to your door. Get Factor and not only skip the trip to the grocery store, but skip the chopping, prepping, and cleaning up too. Factor's fresh, never frozen meals are always ready and in just about two minutes. So all you have to do is heat it up and enjoy. With over 34 chef prepared, dietitian approved weekly options, there's always something new to try. Eating vegan or vegetarian is a snap with Factor because each meal is prepped by chefs and approved by dietitians, so you know that your Factor meal has all the ingredients you want and nothing you don't. And if you're looking to mix it up, you can always add protein to any select meals each week. Get Factor and enjoy clean eating without the hassle. Simply choose your meals and enjoy fresh, flavor-packed meals delivered straight to your door, ready in just two minutes. There is really no easier way to eat well. No matter what your lifestyle is, Factor has the meals to help you live life to the fullest with keto, calorie smart, vegan or vegetarian, and protein plus meals on the menu each week. Plus, you can go around out your meals and replenish your snack supply with an assortment of 36 quick bites, smoothies and juices and more satisfying add-ons. Achieve and maintain your goals this year with Factor. Get America's number one ready to eat meal plan Start saving time, eating well, and living the best year ever. Head over to Factor75.com slash Exit60 and use code Exit60 to get 60% off your first box. That's code Exit60 at Factor75.com slash Exit60 to get 60% off your first box. I had heard of it, but like I swore it was like a myth. I had no idea how depending your body can get on it because like when you're a kid like you, you're not even addicted to caffeine yet you know what I, mean? I thought i thought you could only get addicted to like heroin, heroin. yeah like yeah. i didn't i didn't associate like pills as being a pill form of heroin yeah and like when pe- i remember uh people would be like you know that's heroin right i would be like no heroin is heroin this pills. is oxycodone you know? <laughs> oxycodone is oxycodone but um people used to say it's like deter you from it and it just never did but yeah, I remember the first time I got dope sick and I, I used to think that like the pills were making me cold. So when I don't do them, I get really hot, which is why I'm sweating. And then I do them and I get cold again. Like I didn't understand that I was getting a fever and then I was getting the chills. And then I think when I started to realize that I was getting dope sick, my friend was like, dude, you're withdrawing. And I remember being like dope sick in high school. And I remember this kid came up to me and was like, you don't look so good. And I remember this, I remember this kid Jensen came up to me and was like, I read about this in health class <laughs> and I remember being like other people know that I'm a drug addict because I had thought like I was kind of hiding it. But like not only do people know that I'm on drugs, but they now understand that like I need them. I, I don't know if I hit it well or if just everyone was like oblivious. But mm-hmm. like, you know, my mom would be like, he just smoked a lot of weed. And I'm like, we don't make you fall asleep in your mashed potatoes. Mm-hmm. For the longest time, I never felt dope sick because I always had things. Yeah. You know, I never like ran out. This this lady that I used to cut grass for, dude, I used to cut her grass because she lived like a couple houses up from me. Her husband was like deathly sick. I remember when, when, he, when he passed away. He had the pills. Bro, she had 40 fucking pill bottles full. It's of crazy because like as a young drug addict, these are the things you're looking for. You're looking for old people who are dying, you know, it's yeah. like, it's so <laughs> fucked up. It's like, as soon as you said that, I already knew where the story was going. Yeah, she was know? like, she was like my, my husband, like the one day she seen me like walking down the street. She was like, can you help me? Mm-hmm. And I really want to tell her like, yo, suck a dick. Mm-hmm. My husband is in hospice. He has cancer or something. She was like, I need someone to cut my grass. And I was like, yeah, I can help you. Cause I already knew. Yeah. As a kid, that's like. It's crazy. It's like anyone with like a fucking back surgery or whatever. Yeah. yeah you're like, I'll rub dude, your how, fucking feet. how can I get in your house? Yeah. <laughs> I will rub your feet. Yeah. You know? And, and I remember that. So like, and then a mixture of that and like selling drugs, like I, I didn't really feel dope sick until I was like a little bit older. Mm-hmm. And then this is already when like everyone knew I was a fucking piece of shit. You know, I've, I've done dropped out of high school. A lot of my friends that I grew up with, their parents were like, yo, you can't hang out with that kid no more. You know? Cause like, yo, high school for me was just like, 
you know, get as fucked up as possible and sleep with every fucking girl you can possibly do it to, you know, or, or sleep with. And like, that's all it really was. In the high school that I went to was in like the county. It's like the nice area, mm -hmm. like the white people area. Yo, I felt like I arrived because I, I lived in Baltimore City. I lived in this neighborhood called Moral Park. And like, it's literally the fucking shit show. Like, it's disgusting. And like, I remember these girls be like, yo, you live in Baltimore? And I'm like, yeah. She's like, can, you, can I come stay at your house? What do you want to pick roaches out of your cereal? You fucking weirdo. Mm -hmm. That was like my thriving point, you know? And like this whole time I'm trying to like hide a drug habit from like these preppy little girls. And then I remember I was like 16 years old. My boy that, that I got the pills from, he was out of town. And like, I woke up one day and was like, yo, I'm fucking sick. And then I'm watching TV and it was like this show. I don't even know what the show was, but I remember the guy was like going into treatment and he was saying that he was a heroin addict mm -hmm. and um, he was dope sick. And like, I seen him like shaking in the video, he's sweating and I'm like, holy fuck, dude, I'm dope sick. Mm -hmm. From there, it was just like at this point where I was like, yo, I'm already here. I didn't know that this like whole thing had existed. Like I've never- Recovery. I never met anyone yeah. that was in Narcotics Anonymous mm -hmm. or Alcoholics Anonymous or Cocaine Anonymous. You know, like Florida is like a whole different breed of the world. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I know kids that were like, yo, I, I was like, I, I was told about the rooms when, when I was like 10 and I'm like, I didn't know about that until treatment. <laughs> it's weird because like, even though like I'm from here, I didn't know about it until like I got clean. It's weird. It's like, you don't know that there's like a society of people staying clean and you just go there and like, and they'll just help you for free. And like, I didn't know that there's like a world of clean people. That For me, I was like, yo, that doesn't exist. Yeah. It was like the Easter bunny. It was like Easter Bunny, Santa Claus, and like getting off drugs. Like, yo, what do you mean you're going to help me for free? Mm -hmm. You know, like, yo, when I, like, when I first like found the rooms or whatever, like, I remember they were like, yo, you need to get a sponsor. And I was like, is he going to like pay me to go to meetings? Mm -hmm. Cause like, yo, I associate a sponsor with like, yo, if you, if you ride dirt bikes, right? People like sponsor I, you. people sponsor you and pay for your things. And I'm like, that seems fucking cool. I'm going to get paid to go mm -hmm. to meetings. Did you ever watch that MTV show? Uh, it was like life coach. What was it called? Where you get like a life coach. Do you remember that show? I forget what it was called. Was it made? No, made. It was where like you would get someone like who like woke you up out of bed and like they would get kids and shit. What was it called? No, remember that was that was where they would that was room raiders. No, not room raiders. Um, when they would wake you up out of bed. Okay, that's I remember room raiders. But there's this <laughs> other show where you would get like a life coach, and it would be like people who want to change their life, and they would like be attached to the hip at you for like ninety days or something. But anyways, that's I what like know. I thought like like a sponsor kind of was as a kid, or like when I got clean. Yo, for me, I don't, I don't know. I came into the rooms and I was like, yo, this is fucking stupid as fuck. What, was your first meeting in Florida? Yeah, it was at fucking Crossroads. I thought it was cool when I first went. I thought it was the coolest thing yeah, ever. You, you ever been to a meeting in Delray? Yeah, but Crossroads is very similar to like PM Recovery. Maybe I, it's like the so, Delray now, PM Recovery. Now that I'm thinking about it, really is. It is. But but the difference was was like yo, I had to do a lot of research to make sure that I really belong here. Mm -hmm. When I first got into recovery, yeah, maybe when you got clean, like you didn't think you were an like really an addict. Yo, I literally yo, I remember when my mom was like. She was like, yo, you're going to like go to treatment or you're going to get the fuck out. And mm -hmm. I was like, all right, I'm going to get the fuck out. And like, I go back into my room and I'm like smoking blues. Right. Cause like, that was my thing. I'd like wake up. I'd like pop five blues, sniff five blues, smoke five blues and shoot five blues. Like that was my thing. Mm -hmm. I remember I was like, yo, fuck this. Like it's cold as fuck too. Right. And I'm like, all right, I'm just going to like go get high real quick in the room. And then I'm bouncing. So I'm like smoking a blue on, on the, on the side of my bed. I have this aunt, right. Her name's aunt, my, my aunt, Sean. And she's a fucking lunatic. Like, I know if, like, yo, if some girl, like, really fucks my life up, like, I can be like, yo, I'm gonna call my aunt Sean, she's gonna beat the shit out of her, right? Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, I'm, like, smoking a blue, and then I, like, I, I do, I, I, I take a hit of crack, and I have, like, this bell ringer, and all of a sudden, I hear that door fly open, and she's like, where's that fucking junkie motherfucker at? And I'm like, oh, shit. I remember my, they told me I was going to California for treatment when I finally mm -hmm. agreed. When I got to the airport, I was still like all fucked up. Cause I smoked like a bunch of dippers before I left. And I was like all geeked up on mm -hmm. PCP. I get onto the plane or whatever. And I finally, like, I'm starting to come down. The scenario is really starting to, to set in. They were like, you have now arrived in Detroit, Michigan. And I'm like, oh, what? Have you been to Michigan prior to that? No, I was like, I didn't even know that really existed. Mm -hmm. 
And the only thing I know about Michigan was like Tom Brady played for the Wolverines, you know, because he's the GOAT. But I was like, yo, where the fuck am I going? I remember like getting off the plane and I seen this guy, he's like holding a sign and it says my name. So like I dip out the side because I, I, you know, snuck some, some mm -hmm. juice with me. And I go outside and I'm smoking the dips and I come back in and I see the guy and I'm trying to walk past him. He's like, yo, are you Brad? And I was like, no. And I'm like high stepping. You ever <laughs> seen someone walk on PCP? <laughs> it's like they're Neil Armstrong on the moon. And uh, <laughs> like literally you're like high stepping with your legs. He's like, are you Brad? And I'm like, no, you sure. And I'm like, no, he's like, you look like you're coming to detox. And I was like, we'll give it away. He's like, I have your face sheet. And mm -hmm. I was like, fuck me. Right. So now I'm geeked up again. And we're like driving to this fucking place. And it, I went to treatment in Battle Creek, Michigan. The only thing there is like cornfields and the Kellogg cereal factory. Mm. That's it. And uh, we're like driving down this, this road and there's like fucking cornfields everywhere. And I look at the guy and I'm like, yo, if you're going to kill me, can I call my mom? <laughs> and he's like, what? I'm like, yo, every scary movie starts in a cornfield. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, you need help, bud. Mm -hmm. And I was like, all right, cool. And then like, I remember they would do this meeting in the treatment center. They would do like an NA meeting or an AA meeting. You know, I, I would go to the meetings or whatever. And I'm like, okay, this is like kind of weird, but cool, whatever. It's like a few people. So when I got out and I went to my first meeting at Crossroads at 830 mm -hmm. on a f like Friday, I think it was maybe a Saturday, right? There's like fucking 85 people in the room. And I'm like, okay, this is fucking weird, dude. And like everyone's hugging each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm like walking through the room, walk into the room or whatever. And the guy's like trying to give me a hug. And I was like, yo, if you touch me, I'm gonna punch you dead in your fucking shit, bro. You know, cause I just didn't understand this. Mm -hmm. It made no sense to me. Recovery just made no sense. And then what changed? You know what really changed the first time I got clean? I remember I woke up one day, I was like listening to music. And like, this is something I do every morning. Like I wake up and I, and I listen to like music and shit and I started crying and I was like, what the fuck dude? Like, what the fuck's wrong with me? You know? And then my mom calls me and she's like, I'm proud of you. I, I went to this meeting and that's the first time I spoke about it. The, molest the molestation, like this guy, he was like talking like, right? Like he walks in and like, I see him walk, I see him come pulling up and he, he jumps out of like a um, S class Mercedes, big dude, tattoos, Wife is a fucking smoke show. Jumps out of Mercedes, smoking wife, comes into the meeting, he's speaking. He's talking about all the shit that he did. It's very similar story to me. Talks about the molestation, and then he talks about being a business owner. Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, like, could I fucking do something with my life? Yeah, recovery is like, because when you see like meetings on like HBO TV shows, like you don't see all the success. You just no. see, because everyone in those TV shows are all struggling to stay clean. Because usually like the meetings in the shows, they're still in treatment. They're like in treatment or it's just like this dungy feeling of like everyone feels like using. And there's like one older guy that might be like the head leader of the meeting. Yeah. And he's like telling people not to use. But like you go to South Florida, you'll see 10 people with over 10 years clean and half of them are like millionaires. You know what I you mean? It's like the, my brother said that. My brother came down from my medallion this yeah. year. After the meeting, he was like, yo, that guy has a fucking purple Ferrari. He's talking about Andrew. He's like, yo, that dude has like a purple Ferrari. Mm -hmm. And then Carl was there. Yeah. Right, with his fucking bench truck. Yeah, he has the G-Wagon. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and it's like, dude, like- My brother's first, like, who are these fucking people? They're drug addicts. Yeah, yeah no, it's crazy. Like, yeah, heroin addicts. <laughs> yeah, and it's like interesting because it's like, uh, my whole life, when you talked about being a crackhead or something, you either were still smoking crack or you were just like s like some crazy person who doesn't smoke crack anymore. I had never met anybody talk about how they used to like eat out of dumpsters and smoke crack and shoot heroin and go to prison. And now they're like ultra super successful. And I have like friends who aren't in recovery. And like if it's not success, it's something else. So like I remember like when I first got clean, I was like obsessed with the gym. And I remember like my friends who weren't in recovery would be like, bro, why is everyone in recovery like swole? And I was like, we don't have anything else to do. Like, we're just bored. <laughs> I don't know. We're just, we just get fixated on shit. And then like years later, like those same friends would be like, bro, how come everybody you hang out with, they're all like super successful. And I was like, we're just bored. We're just like, we get super fixated on things. So it's like, if you're an addict, it's like, you have so much energy and compulsion that when you learn to like use that in a positive way, if it's not like success or like finances or like, like the gym, like it's school. 
Like, bro, I have a friend who like fucking has like eight degrees. I'm like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm just like addicted to getting new degrees. And it's like, you know, there's a healthy way to chase your passion. And addiction allows us to do that almost effortless. And and I think it's also like, yo, I wanted to become successful because everyone told me I couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. There's, I always tell people like, there's no better feeling than doing things that you, people said you can't do. Yo, cause like, I, I remember like, so like I, I work in the call center industry, right? So when I first started in sales, mm-hmm. I've always been in health insurance. You know, when I first started in sales, like I remember that first time I got like a paycheck of like 1500 and I was like, bro, I sit at a desk and watch you too, <laughs> you know what I mean? And smoke my vape, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And then like, I remember like, Yo, like it, it just it just started from there where like, yo, I always wanted to be the best mm-hmm. at everything, right? Because I was like, yo, I'm going to fucking make something of myself. Everyone told me I can't do it. Everyone told me this. Everyone told me that. Everyone told me this. And like, I remember like I'll jump on like Xbox with like my boys from back home. And their favorite thing to say is like, yo, you're a crackhead. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, yeah, but you're broke. You can call me whatever you want, but like I've made something of myself. And I think it was really just because everyone told me like, yo, you're a junkie and you're never going to be shit. Yeah, and it's kind of like um, being like the worst drug addict you are, you almost have to develop skills that are like complementary to business. You know what I mean? So it's like, you know, in active addiction, like we learn how to, you know, tell stories and we learn how to like, I've seen the worst drug addicts ever use those same horrible like tactics or whatever and apply them in a positive way to business and like become the number one salespersons at their office dive into like like the books heavy and graduate college and like all these things like my one friend like mario like dude he uh went to school for finance and everyone told him like bro with your record it's never gonna happen you're never gonna be a cpa and he was like i don't care this is my dream and he said like he had one guy who was like dude just go for it and he had to apply to like all these different firms and he got accepted to like one firm the shittiest firm with the lowest paying job. He said everyone else who graduated in his class were making double the money he was making, but at least he was in the game. And then he became a business owner and all those firms that said no to him ended up working with him anyways later down the road. So it's like, you know, people in recovery find ways and means to adapt to situations. For me, I I look at like, you know, some of my friends, like some of the, some of the kids I grew up with that aren't in recovery, you know, and I'll see them on Facebook where they like complain that they have to fucking go to work or they complain that they have this or they have to do this or they have to do that. Like, yo, for me, like recovery was that shift of perspective where I was like, yo, I get to fucking do this. (laughs) Welcome to the Genesis House powered by the United Recovery Project, located in sunny South Florida. We offer drug and alcohol addiction treatment, as well as a major focus on dual diagnosis. Our addiction therapy programs include behavioral therapy, 12-step facilitation, psychotherapy, life skills training, and more. At our facility, you can expect a low client to staff ratio, daily group therapy, weekly one-on-one therapy sessions, and luxury amenities such as volleyball, basketball, pool, chiropractor, personal trainer, yoga, massage therapy, and more. Contact the United Recovery Project today and let's create a better tomorrow. Like, yo, I should be dead or under the jail, period. So like using made me like know how to work fucking hard. Mm -hmm. Like, yo, it's fucking hard to be homeless and still scrape up money to smoke crack. Cause like crack's not a fucking cheap drug. Yeah. What are you going to do? Smoke one hit of crack? (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, you're never like, well, I don't have a job, so I can't get crack or like, I don't have any money. So it's like it, like you don't have any excuses when you're using like, and no one's going to help you. Like, if you don't have money, no one's going to be like, hey, buddy, I can't got some money for you for crack. You know, like if you don't have money, like you need to figure it out. The the guy that you have to pay to go to take (laughs) you to go get crack, he's not going to call you one day and be like, yo, I know you. I know you get me crack like every day. Yeah, I got I got hit for you. Exactly. It's not a thing. Never. So like, yo, when, when I got into this industry, I'll be honest with you. When I got in this industry, it was just because like, yo, in South Florida, like, yo, you just work in a call center, you work in treatment. Or you fucking mm-hmm. do manual labor. I can't fucking do manual labor. I moved into my house and I bought this pot rack because like I don't have a lot of cabin space. 
Yeah, I bought that July 16th and I just had my boy come over to put it together. <laughs> Cause like, I can't put shit together. So I was like, yeah. yo, there's no way I'm gonna do manual labor. How much is this gonna cost to get done type of guy when it comes to like building shit? I was like, yo, I don't know what else I'm gonna do in my life. So someone was like, yo, why don't you try the call center industry? And I was like, yo, fuck that. I could never work in an office. Mm -hmm. I tried it and I was good. And then I was just comfortable. I was like, yo, I'm mm -hmm. just gonna keep doing this. And then like, yo, the position started like increasing. Then I got like my first management job that management job turned into another management job. And then like my last job, like it, it took me to like a whole different like tax bracket. Mm -hmm. And then I was like comfortable there. And then like someone came to me and was like, yo, your recovery solid. You're fucking great at what you do. You work fucking hard. Like, yo, you want 50% of my company. And I was like, yo, sometimes I still walk in and I'm like, I'm a business owner. The same one that like when he, when I got in, when I, when I came into the fellowship, the only thing I wanted to do was stop going to jail. I was like, yo, if I don't go to jail, like every six months, I'll be straight, dude. Like, I'll yeah, I used to time. dream about having a job at Publix. I, apl I applied to Publix like four times my first year cleaning. It would never hire me. <laughs> but like, I used to just be, I used to really dream about like having a regular job and being able to keep it. And I used to dream about like one day having gym clothes, you know, like I didn't have big dreams when I got clean. Like I used to just dream about like such like basic little things that like, they just kind of like, you know, well, if I could get this little job, then I could get that little job. And if I could save 500 bucks, then I could save up five grand. And like, it just like slowly kept like rolling. And like the thing, the difference between staying clean and using is that when you're clean, everything compounds. So like yeah. when I was using, nothing ever compounded because I would get high and lose it all. So like when I was using, like, even if I went to the gym, like I would lose all my gains because I would just get high or whatever. If I had a job, I would just fuck it up anyways. If I had relationships, I would ruin them anyways. And like, if as long as you stay clean and you stay consistent in something, whether it's school, work, business, the gym, traveling, you know, like whatever you want to do in life, painting, like be a tattoo artist, like whatever you want to do. If you just don't pick up, you go to meetings and you just keep staying consistent at it, everything you learn just keeps compounding. So it's like, I started to realize like, wow, if I just stay clean, I'll get to where I need to go anyways. Cause you were young, right? When you I got was clean. 17. Holy fuck, dude. So like when I was 17, like I started to do the math. Like, okay, when I have 10 years clean, I'll be 27. I've double digits clean time. I'm 27. So if I've been able to fucking get a car in a year, imagine what I could do in 10 years. And it's like, if I've been able to fucking go from weighing like 140 pounds to like bench pressing 315 pounds in a year and a half, two years, like what the fuck would I can do in like five years? I think when I first got clean, it like felt like it was never going to happen. And like every, like these were just like dreams that were so far away, but it's like anything else. It's like, you know, if you have a dirty ass room and you just look at it, it seems like you're never going to be able to clean it, but you start cleaning like a little bit by a little bit. And then you start to see the fucking floor and then you start to fucking clean out everything else. And then you start to fucking clean the floors and clean under the shit. And then like little by little by little by little, you start to fucking see that like there's some hope that maybe you will clean out the room. And like your whole life, like and when you get clean, like your life is a fucking dirty ass fucking room that looks like it can never get clean with like mold and shit and clothes everywhere. And you almost just wanna keep the door shut and just not look at it. But like, that's why working the steps is so important because it causes you and forces you to look at all the shit you don't wanna look at and fucking look under the rug and look under all the fucking shit that you thought was fucking out of sight, out of mind. You still to this day, I never understand. You never, you ever like be in meetings in the newcomer where they have like 14 days. Mm -hmm. They're like, yo, I'm so grateful for my life. I'm like, you're a fucking weirdo. Because <laughs> when I first got here, I fucking hated everyone. Like I remember when, when I first came back this time, Kitty was doing the step series mm -hmm. at Sunshine. I remember sharing every single week that I don't want to be a member anymore. Mm -hmm. I want to fucking die. I don't want to be here. I don't want to stay clean. I don't fucking like my life. I hate everyone. Don't call me. Don't fucking hug me. Get the fuck away from me. You know, like I remember it just doesn't make any sense to me. Like, yo, like I, when I see people in their new, I love it now, mm -hmm. but when I see new people and they're like, I, I love my life. And I'm like, bro, stay. And then watch when you see mm -hmm. what happens, you know? Cause like, I remember when I first got here, I was lost and I was broken and I was hopeless. Yeah. And it's like the whole pink cloud theory. So it's like, you know, 
I don't know. I try to tell people that you don't want to be too one way and too the other way. I've also seen people, Mario Ciccarelli, dude, he was on the podcast. Bro, this kid came into recovery fucking on a level 10. I'm so grateful to be here. This is the best place in the world. And you would look at him like, all right, bro, just keep coming. And like 10 years later, he's still like that, you know? So like I have seen people come in super excited to stay clean, super positive, and just stay that way. And I've also seen people come in super positive and then not do the work and then fucking lose it all. And it was all like a facade or whatever. Um, but the reality is, is that like for years, people still wear a mask. A lot of times, even someone like you that comes in that says, fuck this place. He's really saying like, somebody love me and show me that I belong That's because exactly I don't want to be here. And then the same kid who's sharing about how great life is, is doing the same thing. You know, so it's like, yeah. you know, what I've learned in recovery is that like opposites are the same. So someone who overeats and someone who's anorexic are the same thing because you can't love yourself and not eat food and you can't love yourself and fucking overeat food. So the person who's like super happy to be clean and the person who's like, dude, fuck you, you're annoying. I fucking want to kill myself. It's the same behavior inverted. Yeah, like, yo, when I got here this time, like, I, I just, yo, I was so done because, like, yo, I, I had the three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then after that, yo, it was four, four or five years of just misery. And then, and then, like, for me, like, it was hard for me to open up, get a sponsor and all those things. Cause, like, yo, I remember I, I was, I got into recovery again in, like, the Lake Worth area. Mm -hmm. You know, I kept using whatever, I kept fucking up getting clean, fucking up, getting clean, fucking up, getting clean. And then like my child's mother, you know, when we were together, this kid who was like her best friend, like I asked him to sponsor me. And then like when we found out that she was pregnant, like yeah, we didn't know who the kid's dad was. It was either me or him. And like, that was my sponsor. And like, I, yo, I just got in like this dark place, man. You know, cause then like when everything happened and, and she chose adoption, right? In, in my head, I was like, yo, fuck that. But then I was also like, yo, I can't stay clean. And like, I don't ever want to raise a kid like that. You know, so like I agreed to it for a long time. It's just like, yo, I felt like a piece of me was missing because like I gave my child up for adoption. And I was like, yo, one day he's going to be like, yo, this kid's a fucking piece of shit. My dad doesn't even love me. Mm -hmm. You know, and like I had these feelings of like, he's going to feel the way that I feel about my dad. And that kept me sick, man. It kept me sick. And then I couldn't get a sponsor because I couldn't open up and I couldn't trust someone because like it was the first molestation and then the second one and then the third one. And then like the kids that I grew up with, like in that whole lifestyle of like, you know, do all of these things for me. I love you. I love you. I love you. When in reality, it's like, yo, do all these things for me. So when you go to jail, I don't. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, and I started realizing that all these people were just fucking using me my whole entire life. And then like, I get into recovery. It's like a fucking Murray show about who the father is with mm -hmm. me and my fucking sponsor. And I was like, yo, fuck the program. Like these people are fucking dirtbags. Mm -hmm. But then, you know what I, you, you know, it took a long time for me to realize this, but the program is a perfect program for imperfect people. The program is the 12 steps, mm -hmm. right? The 12 steps, the 12 traditions, the 12 concepts. That's the program. The people inside of it is the fellowship. Meetings are fellowship. Mm -hmm. You know, going out to eat, that's fellowship. That's not the program. Yeah, and like a lot of times people put too much emphasis on like, friends in the program and what type of relationships they want to keep and like when i first got clean i remember there was like all the cool kids at the tent and i remember i used to look at them and be like i want them to be my friends and i would try to be friends with them and like they didn't like they were nice but they didn't like weren't letting me i felt like i wasn't able to be friends with them and then the people who were coming up to me were like the fucking 10 o'clock weirdos you know, like some 50 year old dude and some other fucking dude with a wallet chain and like some other dude in like a Nirvana t-shirt and like just like older people that I, I was trying to be friends with like the young cool kids. Man, some of those older members saved my life. And I didn't realize that a lot of those kids that I thought had because like they all talked the lingo and like knew everybody. I didn't know that some of them only had three months clean. I didn't know that some of them only had four months clean. I didn't know that this one kid that just got a year has gotten a year four or five times and like uses every time after he gets a year. I remember like feeling like I don't fit in because when I got clean, like, you know, I didn't have any friends my age. I felt totally alienated in high school. I sat by myself every day in lunch. So like meetings were the only place that I actually felt a part of. 
I didn't really even feel like I belonged at meetings sometimes, but I felt more a part of there than like with my parents or with like my siblings. So I just felt like so alone. And I remember like at six months clean, my sponsor uh, was like, what's wrong? And I was like, nothing. And he looked at me and was like, dude, something's (laughs) wrong. And I didn't understand everything I was doing had a significant purpose. So when they tell you to call your sponsor every day, this is what we talk about when we t- when I talk about like putting the hurricane shutters on before the hurricane. So I had talked to this man and called him every single day for six months. So he knew by the look in my eyes and the sound of my voice that something was wrong, that I didn't even think anything was wrong. And I'll never forget, he was like, we're gonna talk after the meeting, you're gonna tell me what's wrong. And I literally was like, bro, nothing's wrong. And I'll never forget, like I got in this man's car and I remember he turned the music off and he's like, tell me what's going on. And dude, I started crying like a little kid. Yeah. And I blurted out, I don't fit in. I don't have any friends. I don't know, like no one wants to be my friend. And I remember like when I started praying, when I first got clean, I used to say, God, if you're real, I just want to have friends. Like that's how alone I felt. And I'll never forget, he started to laugh and he said, he was Russian and uh, he used to refer me to as the Brian. And he used to be like, when the Brian stops trying to be friends with everyone else and learns how to be okay with the Brian, other people will start to fit in with him. And I remember when he said that, I was like, what type of like <laughs> ass backwards? Like it made no sense to me. I was like, what is that? But what I started to realize was that I need to welcome the people that are in my life instead of picking and choose who I need in my life and just be grateful and like nourish the relationships that are coming my way. Because it's like, bro, if you don't have any friends and some fucking 50 year old weirdo is trying to be your friend at a meeting, well, guess what? Time to be friends with that guy. And man, I became friends with some people that I never in a million years that I would ever hang out with, you know, and doing service. So I met some of my best friends, my best friend, Carl. Dude, this guy wouldn't even talk to me when I've had a year clean. Like he literally used to avoid me because I used to share so many burning desires. And he used to share. He was like, bro, they said, stick with the winners. You weren't winning. <laughs> like that's literally how he felt about me. Yo, and that's that's like a Carl thing. For sure. That's such a Carl thing. And I remember it? he asked me to speak for him when he found out I had a year because he couldn't believe it. And bro, I spoke at a meeting and like he made a joke. He was like, you're going to be my BFF. And we became best friends till today, almost 15 years later. We're still best friends. We still hang out all the time. I'm the godfather to like his kids. I didn't pick Carl to become friends with, you know, like I was doing service and he asked me to do service and he had an H and I commitment. And like, I truly believe like that's how we started to become friends. And I meet people in the program who are like, you know, I always feel like you and your clique never really welcomed me. And I'm just like, bro, what does that have to do with your recovery? Like your recovery is about staying clean and doing service and helping other people and relationships grow naturally. So like, I understand when people say shit like that, cause like, yo, I, I've been there, but you know what I had, a, you know, what I realized was, yo, sometimes people are in, in your life just for the situation that you need them in. Mm-hmm. Right. Cause like, I remember like throughout the years of my recovery, my friends have changed so much, right? Like the people that I'm friends with now, the people that I'm closest to now, Besides like my boy, Jay and, 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 and his, his bay mom, Chelsea, we grew up together since we were kids. And then, uh, you know, this other guy, John, that, that I've been friends with for four years. But like, other than that, every person that I talk to or that I'm friends with, I, I've, I never was friends with before I got clean this time. Mm-hmm. Because I always realized that like, yo, when I got clean and, and I was in and out, in and out, in and out, I tracked it. I attracted the people in my life that were the exact way that I felt about myself, mm-hmm. right? Like I, I felt like I was like a piece of shit friend. I felt like I didn't care about anyone but myself. I felt like, you know, I wanted to be like the limelight of a fucking attention. Like, yo, look at me. Like I'm the coolest person in Narcotics Anonymous. Mm-hmm. That's the way I thought. Yo, then I, then I was like, yo, well, you know, the friends in in that fellowship, they fucking suck. They, you know, that, that was like where, you know, I found out my sponsor was sleeping with my baby mom. So I switched over to the other fellowship. And then like, I started like, you know, I was relapsing all the time. So I like the people that I had around me were like shit show of friends, Mm -hmm. you know? And then like, it wasn't until like, I really got serious in my recovery. Yo, I didn't even choose the people that I have in my life. They just like started calling me, you know, like I'll never forget. Like when my little brother got killed in, in May, I shared at a meeting and, um, you know, I, I remember, I, I still remember what I shared. So I raised my hand and I was like, listen, I don't want to use, I don't want to die. You got killed in Maryland? 
Yeah. Well, in California. Mm -hmm. I was like, I don't want to use, I don't want to die, but I don't want to live. And like, I shared what happened and I was like, yo, I, for the first fucking time, like something really crazy happened in my life and I don't want to fucking use, mm -hmm. but I don't know what to do with my life. And then like Carl called me every single day. Oh, that's cool. For months. Yeah, he's a good dude like that. And then like now I have this group of friends like, you know, Dana, Jordan T, Walt T, John M, Baltimore John, who's my sponsor now. He's yeah, he's the man. He's been my sponsor since I got that's clean cool. this time. And like, and then my sponsorship family, right? Like I started realizing that like, yo, once I started staying clean, the people that I attracted into my life are like genuinely loving people. Mm -hmm. You know, like I, I have friends now that I didn't even talk to when I first got clean because the reality of it is, is like, yo, I, I didn't stay around long enough for you to get to know me anyway. Mm -hmm. And it's like, dude, being in recovery, it's like people don't realize like, bro, I've been clean 14 years. Do you know how many faces I've seen come and go? So it's not that like, I don't care. It's like, dude, I just see so many people come and go. It's hard for me to have real relationships with everybody. It's impossible. But when I see someone share something really vulnerable in a meeting, I start to feel like I know them a little bit. But when I see someone like never share in a meeting or share super negative stuff, like, yeah, it doesn't mean like I'm not going to, I'm not going to reach out to them. But I'm also like letting you have your own process. I'm not here to police you. I'm not going to say, hey, you should really think about this. And at the same time, it's like, dude, I'm, I'm my own person with my own job and like whatever. And when I first got clean, I would be like, that person has 20 years clean. They should be my friend, you know, and, and just like have unrealistic expectations on how friendships are born because I had never had real friends. I never had a friendship long enough to even know what it takes to be a friend. So like, I think that like doing service is what really bridged me to people liking me and wanting to be around me. You know, people used to show up to, to anything I did, anything I did, people would show up and people would be like, yeah, well, dude, Brian called me every day when I had 90 days clean, you know? So like, I understood that like giving love was how I was going to receive love. And my whole life, I would just take, take, take and take. You know, like friendships have to be nurtured. Yeah. They have to be, gro they have to be grown. Like you Over time. And you can't just, mm -hmm. you know, I can't just like walk up to you one day and be like, yo, you're my friend. Mm -hmm. You know, for me, it was like, yo, when I finally put the fucking bat down and stop saying like, yo, I'm a piece of shit. I'm never going to be shit. I'm never going to do shit. I'm never going to have shit. Nobody's ever going to want me for shit. Mm -hmm. When I stopped doing that and I started like actually fucking working a program, right? Because like the, the thing that makes me the most mad is like, yo, when you hear people sharing, my, my fucking life sucks. You know, and then you talk to them and you're like, yo, do you got a sponsor? They're like, no. Exactly. Yeah. You ever work steps? No. Like, yo, sometimes like I feel like I'm an asshole when I say this, but I'm like, what the fuck are you doing in a 12 step fellowship and you're not working 12 steps? Yeah. And it's like, you know, I always come from the point. It's like, dude, you're just missing out. It's like you did the hardest work and didn't open up the present. It's like you did everything that was so difficult about getting here. And then you didn't like reap the benefits of getting here. It's like working a whole week at your job and be like, yo, I don't want my paycheck. Exactly. 1000%. For what? Yeah. You know, and it's like, yo, it's, it, and, and that's my thing was like, yo, when I started, like when I started really working steps, like thank God for my sponsorship family. Right, like my sponsorship family, we just went on our retreat in December. Yo, it's like amazing. I know you probably heard about it. You mm -hmm. know, 350 men in the woods in North Florida. Yo, the average clean time was like 20 years in that room. It's crazy. 350 mm -hmm. men, all types of different states, different countries. Thank God for shit like that. Because like, yo, when I got into recovery, I was like, yo, what do you guys do for fun? Because I can't fucking eat at Lester's anymore. <laughs> I fucking hate it, you know? And like, all of a sudden I started realizing that like, yo, everything I have in my life is from my fellowship. Mm -hmm. My house that, 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 I, that I rent, the realtor was in, in the fellowship. The car that I bought, I got it through a kid in the fellowships, best friend's dad owns Lexus mm -hmm. of Pembroke Pines. I was like, got my car pretty much through the fellowship. My business through someone in the fellowship. You know, all of my friends are in the fellowship. I don't have like normal friends, like normies. Mm -hmm. Not that I don't want them or not that, not that I feel like I, I can't have normal friends, but I just, I really don't want them because like, yo, nothing's better when I'm like, you know, we're like laughing and joking and like, you know, jo I do this to Jordan all the time where it's like, he'll get like stumbled in his words and every time like drugs. Drugs, drugs. And like normal people don't like shit like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Like you can't joke around and be like, yo, remember that one time I smoked crack in your bathroom? 
Yeah. And, but like, it's interesting because like the longer I stay clean, the more I see how fucked up regular people are. Because like, you know, when I first got clean, I used to have like this idea that like people in recovery were fucked up. Dude, this one time I bought a, I bought like my dream car, it's a GTR. And I got added to the South Florida, G, shout out to the South Florida GTR chat. It was the most fucked up shit I've ever seen in my life going on in this chat. I'm not even going to talk about it. It was not car related. <laughs> and I was like, this, these people are fucking crazy. It was the craziest shit I've ever seen in my life in a group chat. I don't know. Makes makes me feel like I'm pretty normal. You yeah. know, we we might have to add you to the degenerate chat. Or, or, <laughs> Is or, a degenerate chat? Or uh, Warzone over hose. We had uh, shout out to my Warzone over hose guys. <laughs> we had we, there was a Facebook thing called the Buckshank, and this was probably before you got clean. That was probably this. That was the most fucked up shit ever, but those are like drug addicts. Like seeing non-drug addicts do fucked up shit, it's like, you know, everyone has their own stuff. You know what's interesting is like my brother-in-law started going to um to therapy and um we go to the same therapist. He's been going for a while. He's he like stopped going. He like kind of graduated therapist. The therapy, the therapist was like, you don't need to go here anymore. And he got like fucked over on his car. And he bought a car and he was like, Yeah, bro. So it was like an SUV. So he was like, I opened up the car the other day and i saw this page of an inspection and it said that there was damage on the hood or on the roof so i checked the roof and there was like a fucking big ass mark that they hit something like driving probably through a parking garage and there's a huge dent and i was like so they knew about it and they didn't tell you about it i was like bro i would talk mad shit to the owner i would write a whole bunch of bad reviews fuck that (laughs) and he was like nah bro i went to fucking therapy for that stuff like i'm just gonna let it go and I remember being like, fuck, you know, like he's right. And this is like a normie. This is like, but at the same time, it's like, that's why therapy is not just sufficient for us. Like we need to do a lot of shit, you know? Yo, you know what I hate when people in meetings say that, like, that just like brought up something like, and, and, and it's like a pet peeve of mine and I fucking hate it. When people are like sharing their story and they're like, yo, I go to therapy. I know therapy is an outside issue. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean, people Yo, say that about anything so, so that's not, it, like, specifically recovery or whatever. So it would be an outside issue if I was like, yo, you need to go to therapy. Mm-hmm. How's it an outside issue that I that I talk about me going to therapy? Yeah, I mean, uh, like, the literature is pretty clear, but, like, anything that affects your recovery is okay to talk about in a meeting. And, and it know? also says that, like, yo, some of us need to seek outside help for outside issues. Yeah, and, like, the thing is that, like, recovery allows us to get outside help. You know what I mean? So it's like... Dude, I don't do my taxes. You know what I mean? Like, I fucking get someone to do my taxes. Oh, I thought you were about to say. <laughs> like, I don't pay taxes. <laughs> no, but like, you know, it's like, saying, dude, this is I got outside. I get outside help for my taxes. I get outside help for like my medical shit, you know? So it's like, you know, it's okay to pay professionals. We're not paid professionals. You no, know what and, I mean? and that's what, that's what pisses. I don't know. Like, though, that's like a pet peeve. And like, yo, when I started talking about that, there, there is things that like, yo. Have you ever been to like a meditation meeting? And everyone talks about their gurus. Yo, I can't sit still long enough. Uh, There's no way. You'll get there. So like, yo, my meditation is not me like sitting in my room by myself, mm-hmm. no noise, right? Like, yo, my meditation is like, yo, sometimes I'll jump in my car. I mean, if you look at me, you probably don't think that I love country music, but I really do, right? I can like like who Morgan Wallen He's so and good. Um, crazy. Morgan Wallen's coming to the West Palm Beach Amphitheater, mm-hmm. and like I'm trying to convince my girl, right? We both work in sales, we both b- both work in health insurance, and I'm like, babe, but listen, right? If if we buy these tickets, right, um, you get a shirt, <laughs> and you're closer. Nice. And she's like, yeah, well, like, you're not spending that much money on tickets. And I'm like, but hear me out, right? Like, I was like, memories are priceless. Mm-hmm. And she's like, right. So, like, the memory's going to be the same whether we're closer or not. But yeah, so, like, that's my meditation, bro. Like, I like driving in my car down on, like, A1A and just listening to country music, just chilling out. Mm-hmm. And I just drive and, like, yo, that's my meditation, man. Because, like, I'm not the one that, like, can sit in the room and just, like, be still whatever like you gotta do it yo meditation for me is like even if you do a minute at a time but if you do it every single day you slowly get better at it so i i do do like a form of like so like yeah so i'm a, it's not the same so i'm a muslim okay right so like when we when we pray you know we're on our prayer mat mm-hmm. you know it's it's just me it's it, it's just me and my god right uh, maybe that is like a form of like prayer meditation because it is quiet. Okay. 
for me, meditation, like the way that I associate meditation is like when like I'm in a situation and I can let thoughts come in and leave and mm -hmm. come in and leave and come in and leave. I don't think there's one way to meditate. No, there's not. So, you know, like I do jujitsu. So like when you're doing jujitsu. I did you, too for years. Oh yeah, it's awesome. So it's like, you can't, um, you can't think about anything else other than this person right. not choking you. Right. So yeah, someone could say that's a form of meditation. But at the same time, it's like, there is nothing that compares to sitting your ass by yourself with nothing. You could, you, you can say that driving a car and listening to music is a form of meditation. But what the fuck do you do when you don't have a car and you don't have music? So when you're able to sit by yourself with nothing, no music, no phone, no headphones, by yourself in a room with nothing, it is like cooking with fire. It's like what it's the core of meditation. That's what it is. So I'm yeah. not saying that like, you know, other forms of meditation aren't meditation, but doing a couple minutes of that is unparalleled. There's nothing else that can even be close to it because you can drive for hours and listen to music and feel okay. But if you can't sit still for five minutes, think about it, five minutes, you can't sit still for five minutes. That's something you could work on. I, I guess, I, I guess I just did, don't associate it with meditation, but I know like, yo, when I first wake up in the morning, before I jump on the prayer mat, yo, I literally just, I, I literally just lay and just like look at the ceiling. And then I, th you know, I don't know if this is like a form of meditation, but I think about what I did yesterday, like my reactions with mm -hmm. people or my interactions with people both, right? And and think of like, yo, what ways could I have like, you know, maybe yeah, handled like situations. Yeah, do like a 10 step. Yeah, basically, mm -hmm. yeah, do like a 10 step, and, and, you know, while I lay there. And then I just, and then I just lay there, you know, and, and I just lay there and look at the ceiling and I just like, yo, I, I, I cause I need, in the morning I need that, if I wake up late and like I'm rushing, bro, my whole mm -hmm. day's fucked. Like I need that yeah. whole, I need that, that moment where I, where it's just like me, mm -hmm. you know, and I just chill for a second. Yeah. Like assess my day. Sure. Absolutely. You know, and, and it's like, I just, I, I know like, yo, I, I do different things of like, as, like a form of like a decompressing type of thing, you know, depending on the situation I'm going through or depending on what I need. Cause mm -hmm. like sometimes, you know, when I do that, when I sit alone by myself in the quiet, like, yo, sometimes I can really fuck my head up, mm -hmm. you know? And sometimes I need to just like take a step back, go drive the car or go to the beach, sit there at night, not a beach person during the day. Mm -hmm. I fucking hate it. But, you know, so for some reason, the beach at night is pretty cool. You know, so I, I use like different forms at different times. Absolutely. Well, hey, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Dude, you killed it. I appreciate you. How long have you been clean now? Sunday will be 17 months. Wow. Congrats, bro. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming out. I appreciate you, man. Anytime. How's it going, bro? Thank you. you. Too. This show is not affiliated with any specific 12-step program. If you or a loved one is struggling with an addiction, please find a local 12-step meeting. If you believe you may need detox or drug treatment of any kind, please call 833-999-1877. To speak to a specialist. The show is sponsored by United Recovery Project, a state-of-the-art drug and alcohol rehab facility. You can visit our website at unitedrecoveryproject.com. <laughs>